welcome to my channel. I'm Scott, and in this video, I'm going to walk you through the process of valuing future fuel stock so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Let's get started with the model. This is a small cap company, 386 million market cap. They're trading at 880 to a share, and they have 44 million shares outstanding. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future, and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. They had 92 million of free cash flow in 2020. Then it went down to 43 million in 2021, up a little to 48 million in 2022. In the trailing 12 months, it's down to 27 million. But it's still pretty impressive they generate positive free cash flow with so little revenue. We see companies with 10, 15 billion of revenue with negative free cash flow. The fact that they're generating positive free cash flow with just a few hundred million of revenue shows they're running a pretty successful business. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And that's pretty steady from 2020 to the trailing 12 months. It did dip in 2021 and 2022, but it is positive every year. Revenue is a sales for the company, and that doubles from 205 million to 428 million. Things seem to be moving in the right direction with this company. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four, that's 1.1 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $1 billion. We divide that by 44 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $23. They're trading at $882, so they're trading at a 61% discount. It's a really strong buy according to the model. I don't think my free cash flow estimates were too aggressive. They're in line with their prior free cash flow, so the stock looks like a great value. On top of this, they also pay a dividend. There are 60 companies in the specialty chemicals industry and Future Fuel ranks 47th in terms of market cap. The average of the 60 companies is 10.8 billion, the median is 2.1 billion. So they're much smaller than most companies in the industry. Look at Lindy, 180 billion. FF doesn't spend that much in CapEx, only 6 million, a lot less than the median and average. They've always been a debt-free company, so they have a zero debt to equity ratio. They pay a really nice dividend, 2.8%, much higher than the median average. They don't generate much free cash flow relative to the average in the industry, but they generate a lot relative to their market cap. And the way you can figure that out is their price to free cash flow. It's 14, much better than the median average. All their price multiples are amazing. Price to book 1.3, PE below 8, and price to sales below 1. When a company has a price to sales below 1, that means their revenue is higher than their market cap. And their five-year annual revenue growth rate is 9%, which is the average, higher than the median. Look at international flavors and fragrances. They're at 28%. That's the highest on the list. DuPont de Mures is negative 9%. They're the only negative on the list. The reason I picked this company to do a video on is because I ran a screener in E-Trade. I picked every micro cap and small cap stock that had positive earnings. And I excluded certain industries. And once I got my list of companies, I filtered out all the companies that had a PE below 10, price to sales below 2, price to book below 1.5, and debt over capital below 10%. There were only five companies that fit the parameters. Bridgeford, Hydric, I did videos on those recently. This company, then I'll do a video on resources connection, and then a video on now. Let's take a look at their latest 10Q. This is as of 3-31-2023. Let's start off looking at their income statement. So for the first quarter of 2023, revenue of 74 million, which is up a lot. It was 42 million in the first quarter of 2022. Let's get a breakdown of the revenue so we know what it is. Of the 74 million of revenue, 10 and a half million is contract revenue from customers with greater than one year arrangements. 64 million is below one year. Of the 74 million of revenue, 10 and a half million is bill and hold revenue. 63.6 million is non bill and hold revenue. Bill and hold revenue is billing the customer at the sale, not when they deliver the product. That's not how most companies do it. Most companies only bill customers when products are shipped. So they're billing customers, but holding the product and they're shipping at a later time. 
but most of their revenue is non-bill and hold. Only maybe about 15% of their revenue is bill and hold. Of the 74 million of revenue, 17 million is custom chemicals, 5.3 million performance chemicals, 22 million of total chemicals, 52 million of biofuels. Let's try to understand their revenue a little more. They have two reportable segments, chemicals and biofuels. The chemical segment manufactures diversified chemical products that are sold externally to third party customers. This segment is composed of two components, custom manufacturing, so that's manufacturing chemicals for specific customers and performance chemicals, multi-customer specialty chemicals. In their biofuel segment, they manufacture market biodiesel. The sales of biodiesel are through their Batesville plant. The biofuels revenue also include the sale of biodiesel blends with petrodiesel, petrodiesel with no biodiesel added, also renewable identification numbers, RINs, biodiesel production byproducts, and the purchase and sale of other petroleum products on common carrier pipelines. If any of this is confusing or if you need more color, leave a comment and we can discuss further. Their cost of goods sold is 52 million and 558,000 of distribution. So their gross profit is 21.6 million, which is a big improvement from last year. They had a loss of 7.2 million. They scaled enough to cover their fixed costs and now they're profitable. That's a big win for the company. Here's a breakdown of their gross profit by product. They had 22 million of chemical revenue and 8.6 million of gross profit. Biofuels revenue 52 million, 13 million of gross profit. So their margins are much higher in their chemical division as opposed to their biofuel division. But they're both profitable, which is good. Last year they had a loss in biofuels of 13 million. So they generated 21 million of revenue and had a loss of 13 million. Now they generated 52 million of revenue with a gain of 13 million. They had pretty much the same amount of chemical revenue last year and this year, but they're much more profitable. Their gross profit went from 5.4 million to 8.6 million. Let's look at their expenses for the first quarter. 1.1 million of compensation expense. This is stock-based compensation. Most companies don't list stock-based compensation on the income statement. It is on the income statement for every company, but it's combined with other expenses, so you don't know the exact dollar amount of SBC. Stock-based compensation is a way to pay employees with equity, and it's a non-cash item, so it needs to be added back on the statement of cash flows. SBC only hits the income statement when it's actually earned by the employee. If you give employees options and those options never exercise, meaning they're out of the money, then they won't hit the income statement. When they actually exercise, when the stock goes up to a certain point, then it will hit the income statement. One million of other expenses and 153,000 related party expense. These three expenses I just mentioned are all part of SGNA, selling general administrative expenses. And then you have R&D of one million. So their operating income is 18.3 million. Last year was a loss of 9.6 million. So that looks really good. Interest and dividend income of 2.3 million. This is money they earned from their investments in bonds or their investments in other companies. 33,000 of interest expense. They don't have any traditional debt like long-term debt, but they may lease some offices or warehouses to run their business. So that's where the interest expense comes in. They had a gain on marketable securities of 533000 Last year, they had a loss of $4.1 million. These are mark-to-market adjustments, so they're non-cash items. They'll be reversed out on the statement of cash flows. And they mention it right here. In accordance with ASCII 321, the change in the fair value of marketable equity securities, preferred in other equity instruments, was a gain of 533000 compared to last year of a loss of 4.1 million. Their income before taxes is 21 million. Last year they had a loss of 13 million. Last year they received a tax benefit of 704,000. This year they have a tax provision of 7,000. So their net income in this quarter is 21 million compared to a net loss of 12 million. Their EPS is 48 cents. They have the same exact number of shares outstanding last year compared to this year. Let's take a look at their balance sheet. Current assets of 291 million, 
Current liabilities are 54 million, so they can easily cover their current liabilities with their current assets. Their current ratio is close to a six. They have lots of cash, 145 million, down from 175 million last year. It looks like they sell on credit. They have 26 million of accounts receivables, same as last year. They added a lot of inventory. It was 27 million last year, now it's 69 million. Here is a breakdown of their inventory. 43 million of finished goods. 1 million of work in process, 41 million of raw materials. So that's 85 million of inventory. Then you have a LIFO reserve of 16 million. The LIFO reserve measures the difference between LIFO and FIFO. LIFO and FIFO are inventory accounting. Last in, first out, first in, first out. They have 38 million of marketable securities. Marketable securities are highly liquid investments. Examples are common stock, money market funds, T-bills. Let's look at their non-current assets, 77 million of PP&E, total assets 373 million, up from 356 million. They have 29 million of accounts payable, this means they buy on credit. Another 7.8 million of accounts payable, 3.7 million of deferred revenue, this means they receive cash before they deliver the product. Dividends payable of 7.9 million. These are dividends the company has declared but hasn't paid it out yet. It's more of a timing thing. They should pay this soon. When they do remove the 7.9 million, they need to make another entry in the balance sheet so the balance sheet balances. They would decrease cash in the same amount. They have more deferred revenue, 14 million. This is in the non-current section. That means they'll deliver the product in more than a year. If it's current deferred revenue, that means they'll deliver the product within a year. So total liability, 69 million, down a little from last year. Their additional paid in capital is 280 million. That's how much they receive from selling stock and retain earnings of 22 million. That's how much they profited from running their business. So total equity of 304 million. Let's look at the statement of cash flows. The first section is operating cash flow. And the way you calculate operating cash flow, you start with your net income, then you adjust for the non-cash items on the income statement, then you adjust for changes in working capital. It looks like they spent a lot in inventory, 42 million. So that's a cash outflow. So in the first quarter, they had a total cash outflow of 30 million. Last year, they had a cash outflow of 11 million. But the reason they had a big negative this quarter is because they spent a lot in inventory. When they use the inventory, there'll be a cash inflow in that accounting period. In their investing section, they spent two and a half million of CapEx. In their financing section, they spent 2.6 million in dividends. Let's take a look at this stock on Simply Wall Street. Its last price was 882, 386 million market cap, up 28% in the past year. Future Fuel subsidiary is Future Fuel Chemical Company. It manufactures and sells diversified chemical, bio-based fuel, and bio-based specialty chemical products in the US. The company operates through two segments, chemicals and biofuels. The chemical segment provides various custom chemicals that are used in the coatings, chemical intermediates, industrial and consumer cleaning, oil and gas, and specialty polymer industries, as well as performance chemicals such as polymer modifiers, glycerin products, and various specialty chemicals and solvents. The biofuel segment is involved in the production and sale of biodiesel and petrol diesel blends and the purchase and sale of other petroleum products on common carrier pipelines. This segment markets its biodiesel products directly to customers through trucks, barges, and rail cars. They're headquartered in St. Louis, Missouri. They list a couple of risks. Earnings have declined 18% per year over the past five years. Unstable dividend track record. If you invested $10,000 into this company 10 years ago and reinvested the dividends, you'd have $14,000 today. That's a 43% return, a 3.7% annual return. It looks like they started trading in 2008, right around the Great Recession. And after a few months, the stock came down to below $5. Then over the next five years, it really grew a lot past $20. That was its highest point ever, May 2014 at 21.44. One year later, it came down to below $10 in September 2015. Then for the next five years, it traded between $10 and $18. And then starting in mid-2021, it had a downhill descent. It fell below 6 bucks in September 2022. 
And now it's currently trading a little higher than its IPO price. Here are some news and updates. FF is due to pay a dividend of six cents. Investor sentiment improves as stock rises 16%. That was on May 15th. They released their first quarter earnings, EPS of 48 cents. Let's open up this article. Revenue of 74 million, up 76%. We saw that on the income statement earlier. Net income of 21 million, up 33.5 million from the prior period last year. Profit margins of 28%. The move to profitability was primarily driven by higher revenue. Over the past three years, on average, the company's share price growth has exceeded its earnings growth by 56%, which is a significant difference in performance. Let's look at this article on March 16th. Returns on capital are showing encouraging signs at FF. If we want to find a potential multi-bagger, often there are underlying trends that can provide clues. In a perfect world, we'd like to see a company investing more capital into its business and ideally the returns earned from the capital are also increasing. Put simply, these types of businesses are compounding machines, meaning they are continually reinvesting their earnings at even higher rates of return. With that in mind, we've noticed some promising trends at FF, so let's look a bit deeper. They talk about ROCE, return on capital employed. That's EBIT, also known as operating income, over assets minus current liabilities. Their ROCE is 5.9%. The chemicals industry is 11%. FF has not disappointed in regards to ROCE growth. We found that the returns on capital employed over the last five years have risen by 131%. That's not bad because this tells us for every dollar invested, the company is increasing the amount earned from that dollar. Speaking of capital employed, the company's actually utilizing 23% less than it was five years ago, which can be indicative of a business that's improving its efficiency. A business that's shrinking its asset base like this isn't usually typical of a soon-to-be multi-bagger company. In summary, it's great to see that Future Fuel has been able to turn things around and earn higher returns on lower amounts of capital. Since the stock has only returned 0.6% to shareholders over the last five years, the promising fundamentals may not be recognized yet by investors. So with that in mind, we think the stock deserves further research. While Future Fuel may not currently earn the highest returns, we have compiled a list of companies that currently earn more than 25% ROE. Check out this free list. This is a really long list, so I can't go through every company. They give 816 companies, so they didn't really narrow it down for us. It's a lot to look into. It's a really long list you can see here. I'm not too familiar with most of the names. eWork, I've heard of eWork. I think I did a video on ATOS software. Chipotle, of course I know Chipotle. British American Tobacco. But they list the ticker that trades on the Bangladesh Stock Exchange. Not the US Stock Exchange or London Stock Exchange. Philip Morris. They list Philip Morris, but the ticker that trades on the Slavic Stock Exchange. WW Granger. I remember somebody commented on my channel of this company. I might have did a video on Next. Paychex. They're reporting earnings this week. I might do a video on paychecks. Yeah, I'm not too familiar with most of these companies. NetBay, I'm not sure what that is. Coca-Cola, I think this is the Coca-Cola on the Atlantic Stock Exchange. Zozo, it's an interesting name. Yeah, it's a really long list. Uh, Saudi Airlines, uh, Fastenal, they're reporting earnings this week. I may do a video on them. Guangdong Homer Group, that just stands out because I've done business with a company in Guangdong, China. Burberry Group, Supermicro, familiar with them. Yeah, this is, none of these are ringing a bell. Unless I passed someone that I know, but I didn't see it. Our House, Sabina, I think I did a video on Sabina. Angel One, YouGov, that's a good name. Home Product, JTL, Belimo, Protector, Walmart. Oh, this is the Mexican Walmart. That's a separate division, I believe. Turkey Petrol. That's a Turkish petroleum company. E-Finance for digital and financial investments. Bata India, footwear company. Accenture, Accenture, that's a big company. 192 billion market cap. Monolithic Power, I might have did a video on them. Paycom Software. Karoo, I remember looking at this company once. There's so many companies. 
especially if you go outside the U.S. I mean, it's just unbelievable amount. Delta Electronics, that's a Thai company. Costco, one of my favorite companies to invest in. Meta and Costco, I've always said those are my two favorite companies. I got lots of flack for Meta, especially when a stock was going down. People were upset because they lost a lot of money because I said how much I liked it. But now the stock is back up to 300, and I'm sure a lot of those people sold out of fear. That's the number one problem with investors, and that's the only thing I think I could do better than most investors, is to not buy or sell at the wrong time. A lot of people buy or sell out of fear, and you have to kind of separate fear and emotion from investing. It's hard to do. Here's an article in February, another special dividend may be around the corner. FF generated strong cash flow in Q3, cash over $200 million. Trading and financial conditions are here once more to pay out a special dividend. In the past five years, this stock is down 36% and the market's up almost 50%. The stock is really struggling the past three and five years, although it's doing well in the past year, up 28%. Its industry is up 11%, the market is up 10.5%. Same thing in the past 90 days. This stock is up 14%, the industry 3%, the market 7%. But in the past month, this stock is down while its industry and the market are up. Their current dividend yield is 2.7%. So they pay out 22% of their earnings in dividends. Payout ratios, dividends over earnings. If you want to get the next dividend, the one on 915, you have to buy the stock by August 30th or before. And of course, hold the stock through the record date. Buy in the next 52 days to receive the upcoming dividend. Their PE in 2018 was 12. It was as high as 59 in 2021. Now it's down to eight currently. And their price of sales was high in 2018, 2.7. Now it's below one, so it looks like a good deal. Price to book was two in 2018. Now it's down to 1.3. It is interesting to see, but simply Wall Street says the stock is way overvalued. Their price target is 467. They say it's 89% overvalued. And there's no analyst price targets according to simply Wall Street. Their trailing 12 month revenue in 2012 was 367 million. It was highest at the end of 2013, 445 million. Then it just kept going down over the next six years. It bottomed out at 175 million in September 2020, but it's more than doubled since that point, up to 428 million, almost as high as 2013's level. Even though they don't have a huge amount of revenue, they still manage to generate positive cash flow pretty much every quarter. That's why they're able to pay a consistent dividend. Their ROE is 16%, which is exactly what the industry is, 16%. That's net income over equity. That's how well a company uses equity to generate a profit. Simply Wall Street says Future Fuel's ROE is considered low. If their ROE is considered low, I guess the entire industry is considered low. Their ROA is higher than the industry, 11%, industry is 7.7%. ROA is net income over assets, it's how well a company uses assets to generate a profit. Their ROCE is 14%, three years ago was 20%. And you can see they're always debt free, they don't use any debt, they run their business strictly on their profits, which is a great example for other companies. Try to run your business on your own profits and not have to borrow. Yield of 2.7%, payout ratio of 22%. So their EPS is 111, 22% of that is 24 cents, that dividends per share. So if you own one share, you receive 24 cents in dividends for the entire year. It looks like they pay a quarterly dividend of six cents. In 2012, they paid an annual dividend of 69 cents. They cut it to 24 cents in 2014, and they paid a special dividend of 274 at the end of 2020 and they currently pay an annual dividend of 24 cents. Their yield was 5% in 2012. It's currently 2.7%. The CEO's annual salary is $287,000. Total compensation package, half a million. Tom McKinley has been the CEO less than one year. There's been one insider trade in the past year, a sell for 9,000 shares. 47% of the company is held by institutions, 40% by private companies, and 12% by the general public. Their biggest shareholder is St. Albans. This is an investment management firm in Missouri, where this company is headquartered in Missouri. They own 39% of the company, 17 million shares valued at $151 million. 
The next biggest is BlackRock, then Dimensional Fund, Vanguard, Renaissance, State Street. Invesco owns 1.4%, Royal Bank of Canada 1.3%, UBS, Union Bank of Switzerland 0.7%. The chairman on their board of directors, Paul Novelli, owns 0.6% of the company. They did have 500 employees in 2012. It was up to 592 in 2017, but it's down to 472 currently. The ticker trades in three places, the New York Stock Exchange, the Bursa Stuttgart, and the Deutsche Bursa. So that's the end of the video. Let me know what you think. Give it a like, subscribe, or comment below. If you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.